As the 20th century began, that newfangled invention, the automobile, was still just a high-priced luxury toy for the wealthy. Most pundits at the time seemed to think it would never be anything more than that. In 1900, there were only 8,000 autos in the whole United States, and of the 4,000 or so cars built that year, barely 20% of them were powered by gasoline engines. The others were either steam-powered or electric. The streets of both small towns and big cities of America were still filled mostly with horse-drawn carriages, electric streetcars, and bicycles. And, of course, traffic cops. Early car manufacturers tried to woo buyers with ads emphasizing the convenience of doing away with the horse and buggy. But with the price of an auto at the turn of the century at $1,000 or so, this was an option available only to the upper classes. Adjusted for inflation, that would be $30,000 today. So it caught everyone by surprise when this situation swiftly changed in barely a decade. Particularly in metropolitan areas, the horses disappeared and the horseless carriages jammed the streets. A variety of inventors and auto companies contributed to this phenomenon, but at the forefront of the auto explosion was Henry Ford. Ford built his first vehicle in 1896, an ethanol-powered quadricycle in competition with similar vehicles by other inventors. But that simple vehicle soon evolved into the first Model T Ford, which was built in 1908. It sold for $825. Improvements in efficiency of manufacturing allowed prices to drop precipitously from that time forward. By 1912, you could buy a new Model T for $575. And then Henry inaugurated the moving assembly line at his Detroit area factory in 1913. Production increased dramatically, and the one millionth Ford rolled off that assembly line just two years later in 1915. By that time, Ford was producing almost half the automobiles in America. And by 1927, Henry and his son Edsel Ford could pose with the 15 millionth Ford. By that time, the price of a new Model T had plummeted to under $300, and with the newly introduced idea of a time payment plan, Suddenly, even the average auto worker himself could afford to buy one of the cars he was helping build. The style of automobile most often advertised by both Ford and other auto companies was even designed as a touring car, implying not just practical transportation back and forth around the streets of town or city, but the promise of travel out on the open road. That promise had actually been fulfilled in a big way for the first time in 1903, when Dr. Horatio Nelson Jackson made the very first American cross-country road trip. At a luncheon at a men's club in Sacramento one afternoon, he accepted a casual bet that he couldn't make an auto trip all the way across the U.S. from Sacramento to the East Coast in 90 days. A man of great confidence in himself and unbounded optimism, he threw himself into the project with gusto. It was also helpful that his wife had inherited a family fortune, as Horatio was going to need a lot of money to win that $50 bet. Knowing nothing about autos, Nelson engaged the services of a mechanic to travel with him. They left Sacramento on May 23rd, headed out on a so-called road trip of over 4,000 miles. Although actually, at the time of their trip, there were only 150 miles of paved roads in the whole nation and all of those were inside city limits. The route they traveled consisted mostly of dirt paths, including some of the actual ones traveled by the pioneers in wagons on the Oregon Trail. Fifteen miles into the trip, they had their first flat tire, and it was downhill from then on, with constant breakdowns and challenges of terrain and weather. At one point, they were stranded for eight hours in the desert in Oregon and rescued by a man on horseback who lassoed the car and gave them a tow to where repairs could be made. Sort of an antique version of AAA road service. Also somewhere in Oregon, they picked up another traveling companion, an American pit bull named Bud. 
Bud took to life on the road immediately and loved the excitement. But the constant wind-blown and auto-blown dust along the way bothered his eyes badly, so Jackson outfitted him with his own goggles. Bud loved them and eagerly waited for Horatio to strap them on every morning. It didn't take long for news about their adventure to reach newspapers across the nation, and the trio became famous. Publicity went ahead of them all along the way, and crowds came out to cheer them on. Bud was a particular favorite with the onlookers. The trio finished the trek of about 4,200 miles in just 63 days. The final total expense for the adventure was about $8,000, which would be over 200000 in modern dollars. Yes, it is a good thing Horatio's wife had inherited a bundle. He never even received the $50 for the bet that he'd won fair and square. A diorama at the Smithsonian Museum featuring the actual Winton automobile Nelson used depicts Horatio and Bud somewhere in the great outdoors in a display memorializing that first great American road trip. But Horatio had proven a coast-to-coast -coast drive could be done, and within a few years, a group of auto travel promoters pooled their efforts to create an actual paved route from east to west. They called it the Lincoln Highway, and it stretched over 3,000 miles from Times Square in New York City to Lincoln Park in San Francisco. Although early on, the route across the land was made up of a patchwork of a little bit of paved roads here and there and a lot of muddy ruts. It took until 1938 for the whole route to become made up of fully modern paving, but long before that, it had begun luring more and more travelers to enjoy the pleasures of road tripping. But long before it was finished, the Lincoln Highway found itself taking a back seat to a new upstart roadway that was inaugurated in 1926. One of the first official U.S. national highways, U.S. Route 66 was envisioned as a thoroughfare to take people from Chicago to Los Angeles, a distance of close to 2,500 miles. It was 1938 before Route 66 got totally paved throughout its whole length, too, but by then, it also had become a favorite path for travelers, including many Okies headed to California during the Dust Bowl years. It eventually earned the affectionate titles of America's Main Street and the Mother Road. On their travels across America, tourists could stay in hotels in towns and cities and in what were known as auto courts out in the country that catered to cross-country travelers. In 1925, an enterprising auto court owner in California upgraded and expanded his facility to include attached garages to each small sleeping unit, a swimming pool, and an attached restaurant. He dubbed it a motel, short for motor hotel. The term gradually caught on all across the country and motels sprang up everywhere from then on. Other enterprising fellows attracted overnight guests with clever themed units, such as the famous small chain of wigwams found in various parts of the country. In the 1930s and 40s, perhaps the most popular spots for dining along the highways of America were diners. Yes, the great American road trip fad was building up steam crowding the highways with more and more families on their way to see America. And then it hit a huge bump in the road. The auto factories such as Henry Ford's in Michigan retooled their assembly lines to create a much different kind of vehicle than the touring car. Before the war, in an attempt to build up the tourist industry to help in the economic recovery from the Great Depression, the federal government had encouraged families to get out on the road 
and visit national parks and other tourist destinations. But not after December 7, 1941. At that point, those families needed to get out of the way for more important travelers and resources that had gone to individual family auto use were rationed, with most going to the war effort. Even the tiny few autos made during the war period were stripped down models to save raw materials. For instance, chrome was a vital metal for the war effort. You didn't really need that fancy chrome grill on the front of the car. You could make do, if necessary, with a decorative decal, sort of like a big version of a matchbox car. And then, as abruptly as it began, the situation changed drastically again. And within months of the end of the war, in 1945, the auto manufacturers were back in the business of promoting auto travel again. Yes, along with the post-war baby boom came a boom in the travel industry, and the great American road trip was reborn. Along the increasingly modern highways, including improved Route 66, you could still stop at motor courts in the 1950s, but they were fast being replaced by large chain motels with all the amenities such as swimming pools. Some sleepy parts of the country still provided local diners for travelers but the gleaming new modern architecture of the likes of Howard Johnson's roadside restaurants were raking in more and more tourist dollars. To say nothing of the fast food franchises springing up everywhere to help people get back on the road even faster and less expensively. The most enthusiastic travel promoter of the 1950s was the Chevrolet Corporation, ordering everyone to buy a new Chevy and hit the highways to see the USA. And their most effective spokesperson was songstress Dinah Shore, who ended her weekly TV show throughout the 50s with the bubbly, bombastic Chevy theme song. And Americans, by the millions, obeyed that siren song. Sixty years later, most of us nowadays build our trip plans and find our way around the country with the help of modern technology. But of course none of this was available back in the heyday of U.S. family road trips in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Back then, we planned lodging ahead by consulting one of many hotel motel guidebooks available. 
Paper maps were our guides, and the local friendly service station attendant would be happy to point out on our map the best way to get to our next stop. The most useful service back in those days was the Automobile Association of America, the AAA. The organization inspected and recommended decent accommodations, allowing the use of the AAA logo only by facilities that came up to AAA standards. If you went to a AAA office and gave them your destination plans, a mapper would plot the most efficient route for you, both on large regional maps and on what was called a trip tick, which divided up the trip into manageable chunks, showing you such details as the location of highway rest stops, restaurants, road construction, and more. Thick tour guides for each state or region listed all the AAA-approved food and lodging in those areas, along with details of tourist attractions. Family highway travel was becoming so popular in the early 1950s that children's book authors created books for young children to introduce them to what it would be like if their family took such a trip, such as this little 1952 book. As the story starts out, young Bill and Sandy are headed out on a road trip with mother and daddy to a surprise destination. After traveling all morning, they stop at a gas station for a fill-up, and probably to use the restrooms. After a picnic lunch at a roadside park, the kids take a nap in the back seat. As you can see, this is long before child restraints were standard in autos. After the nap and more miles, they stop at a roadside diner for a yummy dinner. And as the sun sets, they arrive at an auto court to spend the night in a little sleeping cottage. After a refreshing night's sleep and a bit more driving, they end at their surprise destination, Grandma and Grandpa's farm. But in recent years, some other children's books have been published that tell a story about family travel in that same fabulous 50s era that are not quite so idyllic and cheerful, such as this 2010 book. It also has a mother and daddy, a little girl, a road trip, and a grandmother at the end of the road. But the action between the start and end of this trip couldn't be more different from the 1952 book. The scenes in this story take place in the exact same year that Our Auto Trip was published. Young Ruth's daddy just bought a brand new 1952 Buick and is taking his wife and daughter on a trip from Chicago to Alabama to visit Ruth's grandmother. The story starts out cheerily enough, with a little family motoring down the broad highway past pretty scenery. And, like the 1952 book, the happy family stops at a roadside park to eat a picnic meal that Mother brought along. And then it mirrors the 1952 book with a stop at a gas station, too. But all similarities end at that point. Yes, Daddy can fill the car up with gas at the station. But when Mother asks for the key to the women's restroom, she is told the restrooms are provided for the use of white people only. This is Ruth's first experience in her life with Jim Crow laws and customs, since she'd not been out of her own neighborhood in Chicago before. Daddy has to explain to Ruth that she and Mother and he will have to go out in the nearby woods to relieve themselves. And it goes downhill from there. The restaurants along the way all have white-only signs, and they end up having to just eat cold leftover picnic food for their dinner. Daddy planned to stop at a real hotel, but when they arrive, the desk clerk announces it is a whites-only hotel and just turns his back on Daddy. So they end up driving most of the night with a lot of singing to try to keep their spirits up, and eventually pulling by the side of the road to spend a few fitful hours trying to sleep in the car. The next night, they stay with family friends in Tennessee, and Daddy's friend tells Daddy about Esso gas stations. Esso was the one company in that era that consistently served blacks and even had many black-owned stations. So the next day, they spot a friendly Esso station, and things begin to look up. The SO attendant tells Daddy about the Green Book, which was like a AAA guidebook for black families that was published through the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. 
Daddy buys a green book for 75 cents, and from then on, the little family knows where to stop along the way to Grandma's. Ruth is put in charge of doing research in the green book when necessary. That night, they get a good night's sleep in a comfortable tourist home that is listed in the green book. When the car breaks down the next day, Ruth uses the green book to find a repair facility in a nearby town that will serve Negro motorists, and then finds another inn that welcomes Negroes. Many visitors at the inn are Negro businessmen on trips for their jobs, and they all agree they couldn't do their jobs without the amazing green book. And finally, Mother and Daddy and Ruth reach their destination, happy to be reunited with Grandma. Yes, the reality is that all those 1950s tour guides, including the ones put out by AAA, were worthless for the Negro traveler. For many years, black families from all over the United States relied on the Negro Motorist Green Book. It did indeed have a green cover, but was originally named that because it was published by a New York African American named Victor Green from 1936 to 1966. And there is no mistaking the need for it. As one motel survey in 1955 revealed, across the USA, 3,500 motels in the survey would allow guests to keep their dogs in their rooms, but less than 50 would even consider allowing black travelers to rent a room. Jim Crow laws in the South and Jim Crow customs in many parts of North, South, East, and West made it difficult for Negro travelers to find restaurants, motels, gas stations, beauty parlors, drug stores, and much more. In the South, it was totally typical, and in many cases enforced by local laws, for Negroes to be unwelcome in restaurants of all sizes and types. Even most restaurants that would provide food to Negroes would only provide it to them for takeout, not for sit-down dining. Howard Johnson's had a reputation in some parts of the country for integrated dining but not all parts, as you can see in this 1962 photo of a civil rights protest at a Howard Johnson's in Durham, North Carolina, that served whites only. And it wasn't just south of the Mason-Dixon line that Negroes found themselves unwelcome. In areas around Washington, D.C., where foreign dignitaries from black nations might be expected to be looking for a restaurant, it was possible for a small class of Negroes to get served, as seen by this quote from a 1948 segregation report. Many hotels would welcome blacks only if they were from another country. Our visitor's best chance to get a hotel room would be to wrap a turban around his head and register under some foreign name. This maneuver was successfully employed not long ago at one of the capital's most fashionable hotels by an enterprising American Negro who wanted to test the advantages of being a foreigner. But in many places in the nation, Negroes did not even dare pass through the town after sundown. By the end of the 1960s, there were at least 10,000 sundown towns across the U.S., including large suburbs such as Glendale, California, Levittown, New York, and Warren, Michigan. Over half the incorporated communities in Illinois were sundown towns. Blacks often could find no place to use a restroom on trips, but even if they could, it was most often a segregated facility that was provided as an afterthought 
and seldom maintained in a clean condition. Even national parks and other tourist destinations that would logically be provided for the pleasure and recreation of all citizens often provided segregated and limited facilities for Negroes. Yes, the Green Book was a godsend for Negro travelers. Using it, they could easily find accommodations where they would be welcome, like these. It's amazing how much humiliation was heaped on the Negro travelers of that era, not just in the big things like finding lodging, but even down to the minor details, such as being able to just buy your kid a Coke. From the earliest years of the United States, patriotic citizens have been proud to point out that our founding document affirms that every American has the God-given right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That declaration from the Constitution sure sounded good on paper, but it has often been difficult to track the reality down out in the real world. It definitely wasn't true for the Negro traveler for the first six decades of the era of auto trips in the U.S. As the NAACP's magazine put it in 1947, would a Negro like to pursue a little happiness at a theater, a beach, pool, hotel, restaurant, on a train, plane, or ship, a golf course, summer or winter resort? Would he like to stop overnight at a tourist camp while he motors about his native land seeing America first? Well, just let him try. Or, as famous conservative African-American author George Schuyler wrote in 1943, many colored families have motored all across the United States without being able to secure overnight accommodations at a single tourist camp or hotel. He suggested that black Americans would find it easier to travel abroad than in their own country. Perhaps the most ironic reality connected with the history of the famous Mother Road, Route 66, is the fact that legendary performer Nat King Cole, who made the song Get Your Kicks on Route 66 a classic hit, would himself have been turned away from the vast majority of hotels, motels, and restaurants on Route 66. And, just like fictional Ruth's daddy, when he stopped at a gas station, he might very well have had to tell his little daughter Natalie Cole, who was born in 1950, that she'd have to use the woods as her restroom and the car as her bedroom when on a trip. Yes, Route 66 has a complex history. One of the best sources for information on that history is this man, author Michael Wallace who was a consultant to the Pixar Studios for the production of their 2006 movie, Cars, and provided the voice for the sheriff in the movie. Wallace has long been the nation's biggest nostalgia nerd when it comes to the history of the Great American Road Trip. He is particularly well known for his extensive knowledge about the history, nostalgia, trivia, and memorabilia regarding Route 66. He shares his knowledge in books, lectures, personal appearances at nostalgia conventions, and in websites and blogs. The Cars movie centered around the fictional town of Radiator Springs, which was intended to evoke the feel of the numerous small towns that dotted Route 66 back in its heyday of the 1950s and 60s. Wallace took the Pixar crew on a couple of Route 66 excursions and help them get a feel for what the towns and scenery along the Mother Road were like in its heyday. Remember the classic Wigwam motor courts? Their feel is imitated in the Cozy Cone Motel in the movie. And here's the memorable body shop from Cars called Ramones. It is almost a dead ringer for the You Drop In, a famous cafe and gas station built along Route 66 in the 1930s in Shamrock, Texas. Yes, returning in memories to historic Route 66, the Mother Road, with its flashy Technicolor neon signs, fantasy architecture, tasty diners, and comfy motels, is a gold mine of nostalgia for many people, 
and gold mine of profits for those who make Route 66 memorabilia. Route 66 can provide an ultimate feast of technicolor nostalgia for millions of people who grew up enjoying great American road trips with their families along its byways. And Michael Wallace knows more than anyone how to evoke that nostalgia with words and pictures in his books and writings and talks. So to end this trip down memory lane, let's hear a few words from Wallace about Route 66, written in 2014, about a topic he titled The Other Mother Road. A road that was black and white and shades of gray for many people, instead of cheery technicolor, as were the roads across most of the country, north, south, east, and west. Roads that crisscrossed in America that many people today bombastically insist we need to go back to because it was an America that was great. Michael Wallace disagrees with that idea. Listen to his words. We tend to look back through rose-colored glasses and call that time the good old days. Life was easy for many of us in the 50s. Life was as sweet as truck stop pie. At least it was for me, a white boy without a care in the world from a middle-class family living in a comfortable home in the heartland. Now, of course, I know the cold, hard truth. Now I realize those days were not really so good. I only remember them that way. The main reason many of us considered those times the good old days is simple. It comes down to technology. People didn't know what was happening everywhere in the country and the world. They were uninformed for the most part, especially in rural America. There was no 24-hour news cycle worldwide. They were not bombarded with news and views. There was no internet, no iPhones. You cannot restore myths or turn back the clock to a dream that only existed for certain Americans. To live solely in the past is to live in complete denial. Perhaps the good old days aren't good, they're just old. The old wisdom keepers told us not to ask why the old days were better than these, because such a question arises not from wisdom, but from amnesia. Some of us have selective memories. We tend to believe in cliché, romanticize the past, our own past, and edit out any bad memories. In the main, today's astonishing revival of interest in the Mother Road has overlooked the inequities and the negative history that certainly transpired along the road's shoulders and continues in some ways to this day. There is ample reason to question the romanticizing of Route 66. There also is reason to stop avoiding that dark side of the highway story that all too often has been swept beneath the proverbial and convenient carpet. The Route 66 story is both bitter and sweet. A microcosm of the nation, the old road has plenty of scar tissue, much to be ashamed of, and much to brag about, as well as a bright future. Michael Wallace's words don't only apply to Route 66. They can just as poignantly apply to the whole country. Let's reword his thoughts with that in mind. America's story is both bitter and sweet. This old nation has plenty of scar tissue, much to be ashamed of and much to brag about, as well as a bright future. Focus too much on looking in your rearview mirror, pining for where you've been, makes it very difficult to see the road ahead. Americans don't need to recapture an illusion of past greatness. 
We need to work together to build a new America where there finally can be life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone. Look, there's a signpost up ahead. We need to take a great American road trip into that bright future.